Minhaz Zaman was a young man from Markham, Ontario, whose life appeared normal but was marked by significant internal and external pressures. Born to Bangladeshi immigrant parents Moniruz Zaman and Momotaz Begum, Menhaz grew up in a household where it was paramount to achieve academic success. His parents, like many immigrants, held high aspirations for their children, viewing education as the sole pathway to a better future. This emphasis on school shaped Menhaz's early years, creating a foundation of expectations that would later contribute to his psychological distress. From a young age, Menhaz was perceived as a quiet, introverted guy. He was not particularly social and preferred spending his time in solitary activities, primarily playing video games. His academic performance in high school was also pretty good. He later enrolled at York University in Toronto, where he pursued a degree in engineering. His parents, especially his father, were immensely proud of this accomplishment, seeing it as a significant step toward a successful future. However, Menhaz's experience at university was far from successful. The rigorous demands of the engineering program overwhelmed him and he struggled to keep up with his studies. Despite his initial efforts, he eventually dropped out after just a short period. This failure was a source of immense shame for Menhaz, who could not bear to confront his family's disappointment. Instead of revealing the truth, he chose to hide his failure in college and continued to pretend that he was still attending classes and progressing toward his degree. For the next three years, Menhaz built and maintained an elaborate facade. Every day, he would leave home, giving the impression that he was going to the university. In reality, he spent his time in various places around Toronto, such as malls and gyms, or simply wandering aimlessly. He crafted detailed lies about his progress in college, fabricated stories about his studies, and and even pretended to be preparing for exams and projects. This deception extended beyond his immediate family to include friends and neighbors, all of whom believed he was a hardworking student on the path to becoming an engineer. As you can imagine, maintaining this lie created a lot of pressure. This pressure went on to take a severe toll on Menhaz's mental health. The constant fear of being discovered and the weight of his family's expectations created an extreme sense of anxiety and isolation. In order to let off steam, Menhaz would engage in the online world. This allowed him to escape the life that he grew to hate. He became an active member of the Perfect World Void Gaming Community, a multiplayer online game where players could explore virtual environments and battle each other. This virtual space provided him with a sense of belonging and a way to connect with others without the constraints of his real-world problems. In addition to playing in the Perfect World game, Menhaz was deeply involved in various Discord servers related to gaming. Spending time on Discord became a significant part of Menhaz's everyday life. During his time on these various servers, he built a reputation of being rather edgy and provocative. This annoyed a lot of people, but it was clear to others that he just needed a friend to talk to. Additionally, he was more open about his frustrations and often vented about his life, though not always truthfully. His comments ranged from casual gaming discussions to darker, more disturbing thoughts. Some of his online friends noticed these patterns but did not fully grasp the extent of his distress. The anonymity of the internet allowed Menha to express aspects of his personality that he suppressed in real life. Menhaz's father, Moniruz Zaman, was a strict and authoritative figure. As we already stated, Moniruz held high standards for his children and believed firmly in the value of education as a means of creating a better life. Some accounts suggest that Moniruz could be harsh and demanding, sometimes even lashing out in violence. This just made Menhaz all the more fearful of failing him. Momotaz Begum, Menhaz's mother, was the more nurturing parent. She shared many of the same values as her husband. Despite her supportive nature, the combined pressure from both parents created an environment where failure in academics was not an option. Menhaz also lived with his 21-year-old sister, Malesa Zaman, as well as his 70-year-old grandmother named Firosa Begum. Menhaz lived blissfully each day within the lie that he created and hoped that his life could just continue the way it was. But this could never happen. As the supposed date of his graduation approached, the stress of his lie became unbearable. Menhaz knew that once the day arrived, his family would expect a tangible proof of his academic achievements. The impending exposure of his deceit was a constant source of anxiety, and he felt increasingly cornered. Despite his growing despair, he continued to interact with his online friends, often hinting 
hinting at his troubles but never fully revealing the gravity of his situation. The tension reached a peak in the weeks leading up to the planned graduation. Menhaz began to exhibit more erratic behavior online, making statements that alarmed some of his friends. He mentioned feelings of hopelessness and hinted at drastic actions, but his friends, accustomed to his provocative style, did not fully understand that Menhaz was being serious. For example, one of his messages to a friend asking where he was going to play next, Menhaz responded by saying, PW jail. He went on to say, gonna kill my parents and go to jail. On July 27, 2019, Menhaz came to an ultimatum with himself. Rather than confessing his academic failures and having to explain the web of lies he had spun, he made the horrifying decision to murder his entire family. That day began with Menhaz targeting his mother. According to police reports and Menhaz's later confessions, he first approached her with a crowbar. The assault was swift and merciless. He struck her multiple times, ensuring she was incapacitated before slitting her throat to guarantee her death. Next, he turned his attention to his 70-year-old grandmother, Firoza, who was fast asleep. Her age and the fact that she was asleep made her an easy target. Zaman used the same method he had with his mother, striking her with the crowbar and then a knife to her throat. After killing his grandmother, Menhaz waited for his younger sister, Malesa, to return home. To pass the time, Menhaz got onto his computer and started playing some video games. When he heard Malesa at the door, Menhaz got into position and attacked her in the same manner as the last two victims. The final victim was Menhaz's father, Monaruz, who arrived home later that evening. Menhaz waited for his father to settle in before launching his attack, which followed the same process as his other three relatives. With his goal complete, Menhaz stood there to process it all. Then he went to grab his phone to take some pictures. Afterwards, he got back to his video games and opened up Discord to tell his friends about the murders he had just committed. He even sent over those photos he took. At first, his friends did not believe that these photos were real, but instead, something from a graphic movie. One of his final messages sent on Discord said, I've just slaughtered my entire family, and will most likely spend life in jail if I manage to survive. I hope I made you laugh at one point or another. I hope you remember the good times. I will miss you all. After Menhaz's friends came to grips that these murders were real, they came together and worked to trace his location. The online friends began by trying to find Menhaz's IP address. Over the course of 18 hours, they worked tirelessly, piecing together bits of information from his online activities. Their efforts were eventually successful, narrowing down Menhaz's location to the Toronto area. Once they had a general location, they contacted local authorities, providing them with the crucial information they had gathered. The York Regional Police moved swiftly after receiving this information. On July 28th, they arrived at the home and arrested Menhaz without incident. Inside, they discovered the bodies of his family members, just as Menhaz had described in his online confessions. His former friends expressed a range of emotions following his arrest. Some were relieved that their actions had led to his capture, while others grappled with the trauma of having been virtual witnesses to such a horrific crime. The incident highlighted the dual-edged nature of online platforms, which can both harbor and expose extreme violent behavior. Following his arrest on July 28, 2019, Menhaz faced a decisive legal process. The evidence against him was overwhelming, consisting of his detailed confessions and the graphic images he had shared online, as well as the physical evidence found at the crime scene. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. In September 2020, Menhaz pleaded guilty to all charges. The sentencing phase of the trial took place in November of the same year. The prosecutors argued for a severe penalty, emphasizing the pre meditated and brutal nature of the murders. They detailed how he meticulously planned the killings, choosing to execute his family members one by one over the course of several hours. The defense, while acknowledging the heinousness of the crimes, sought to highlight Menhaz's psychological state and the immense pressures he faced, suggesting that these factors should be considered in his sentencing. Ultimately, the judge sentenced Menhaz to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 40 years. This sentence was one of the harshest available under Canadian law. Nathan Larson, born in 1980, was a man with very unpopular and disgusting beliefs, fueling his notoriety. These beliefs spanned multiple facets of criminality and extremist ideology. Nathan exploited the power of online spaces to promote his harmful opinions, which ultimately led to his arrest. He identified himself as a and he frequently advocated for 
Initially, some thought that this was just some form of disturbed satire, but no. This was all very real and genuine. Larson's ability to attract media attention and even some degree of political support highlights the disturbing segments of society. Larson used platforms such as Discord and various online forums to create communities that not only normalize pet but actively encouraged illegal activities. Nathan Larson's journey into the public eye began not with his criminal activities, but with his radical political views. He was involved in a series of controversial bids for political office. Larson first gained attention through his candidacy for the U.S. House of Representatives in Virginia's 10th Congressional District in 2017. His campaign was supported by an extremist platform that called for the legalization of pet the repeal of women's suffrage, and other radical views that are just wrong. Larson's political platform was a disturbing amalgamation of misogyny, white supremacy, and advocacy for crimes. He openly called for the legalization of child and in arguing that these should be considered personal freedoms rather than crimes. His platform also included deeply misogynistic elements, such as the belief that women should not have the right to vote and that patriarchal authority should be re-established. He actively sought to normalize and legitimize his views through his political campaigns. Despite his outrageous ideals, Larson managed to attract media attention. News outlets often covered his candidacies, not because he was seen as a serious political contender, but because his views were so extreme. Larson's campaigns were never successful in electoral terms, but they allowed him to broadly disseminate his views. Parallel to his political ambitions was a disturbing pattern of criminal behavior. In December 2008, Larson sent a threatening letter to the U.S. Secret Service detailing a plan to take out the President of the United States. This threat was taken seriously, leading to his arrest and subsequent conviction. In 2009, Larson was sentenced to 16 months in federal prison for this offense. While serving his prison sentence, Larson portrayed himself as a political prisoner rather than a criminal. He framed his actions as civil disobedience. After his release, Larson remained under supervised release for three years, during which time he continued to engage in controversial activities. One of the most significant aspects of Nathan Larson's activities was using digital platforms to spread his ideologies and engage in criminal behavior. The internet provided him with a vast audience at his fingertips. Larson created and managed several online communities where he could propagate his views without the constraints of mainstream society societal norms. One of the core activities within Larson's forums was the sharing of explicit content. Larson's forums were notorious for being repositories of disturbing material, including illegal pornography. He created a network that facilitated the distribution of explicit images and videos, making it easier for other like-minded individuals to access and share such content without fear of immediate repercussions. Additionally, Larson provided explicit instructions on how to engage in illegal activities. These instructions, or step-by-step -step guides, were extremely detailed and designed to help users exploit minors while avoiding detection by law enforcement. This included advice on using encrypted communication tools, secure file sharing methods, and anonymizing techniques to cover digital tracks. As you would expect, these forums also served as a support network for individuals engaging in these illegal activities. Users shared their experiences, offered tips, and even encouraged one another. This mutual support helped normalize the activities in these people's minds, making it easier for them to rationalize and continue engaging in these messed up practices. Another central activity in Larson's online operations was the grooming of potential victims. He exploited the anonymity of the internet to build trust with vulnerable individuals before manipulating them into engaging in inappropriate activities. And like I said earlier, this guy had a whole step-by-step -step guide made on this, which for obvious reasons I will not be going over. Now fast forward to December 2020 when he was arrested for kidnapping a 12-year-old girl from Fresno, California. Larson had been communicating with the victim online line for several months, utilizing the same techniques he spoke of online. He convinced her to leave her home and orchestrated a plan to flee with her. Adolescence and pre-adolescence can be confusing times for children. They will often feel misunderstood by their parents and other adults. Larson presented himself as a sympathetic figure who understood her struggles. He used flattery, empathy, and promises of a better life to manipulate her emotions and convince her that running away with him was the best solution. He instructed the girl on what to pack, how to avoid drawing attention, and what to say if questioned. He arranged for a rideshare to pick her up from her house around 2 a.m. 
The plan was to fly from Fresno to Washington, D.C. with a layover in Denver. Larson chose this route to make it harder for law enforcement to track them and to buy time to evade capture. The girl followed his instructions, sneaking out of her house and getting into the waiting rideshare. Larson met her at Fresno Yosemite International Airport, where they boarded a flight to Washington, D.C. The layover in Denver was intended to be a brief stop before continuing their journey. Once the girl was reported missing, authorities quickly began their investigation. Through forensic analysis of digital communications, they identified Larson as the suspect. The coordination between local police, airport security, and homeland security investigations ultimately successfully tracked down Larson. As Larson and the girl disembarked in Denver, law enforcement officers were ready. They apprehended Larson without incident. This prevented Larson from continuing his journey and potentially causing further harm to the girl. The charges against Larson included kidnapping, child abduction, solicitation of child and harboring a minor. These charges reflected the gravity of his actions and the extensive harm he had caused. Kidnapping alone is a severe offense, often resulting in substantial prison sentences. When combined with the other charges, Larson faced the possibility of life imprisonment. Prosecutors presented a comprehensive case that detailed not only the kidnapping, but also Larson's broader network of exploitation. Evidence included digital communications, financial transactions, and testimonies from other victims of Larson. Larson's defense attempted to downplay his actions, arguing that his communications were taken out of context and that he had no intention of causing harm. However, the overwhelming evidence and the testimonies of the victims painted a clear picture of a man who had systematically exploited and manipulated vulnerable individuals for his own gratification. Larson later dismissed his legal team, requesting to represent himself in court. He pleaded not guilty. Larson was facing, at minimum, 20 years in prison, but before he could actually receive a sentence, he died. On September 18th, 2022, his decision to take his own life came to a conclusion. Prior to that date, Larson had decided to starve himself to death. He died in custody in a facility located in Arizona.